Let's welcome Pastor Daniel as he comes to introduce our guest speaker. Well, come on, come on. You guys got to be like excited to be a part of a church that's multi-generational, right? How incredible. That was like all next gen people and I was so excited about it. You have no idea. It warms my heart. But today we have an amazing, amazing speaker coming to bring God's word. And I know that God has his anointing all over this man's life. And I know that he's going to come and he's going to deliver something powerful if you'll be open to receiving what the Holy Spirit has for us today. He's a mentor of mine, and he's also a great friend. So if you'll help me welcome Brother Aaron Miller to the stage, bringing the word. Come on, brother. Thank you so much. We're so excited for you to come today. Thank you, man. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. What a joy to be with you this morning. I'm so excited. Um, you know, somebody made a comment that uh, me getting to speak, you know, it required Pastor Daryl leaving. It's not worth it, okay? So if, if, if I could give this up and he would come back, I'd gladly do that. So, um, man, I'm so excited to be with you. I'm going to talk to you this morning about something that is uh, potentially a little bit tough uh, for some of us to hear in the room. But the Lord said to me just a few minutes ago when I was uh, greeting a dear friend who walked in a few minutes ago, I just said, you know, it's the place I'm at. And so I got to preach to you from the place I'm at. And I want to ask you this morning to receive it from the place you're at right now with the Lord. You don't have to pretend you don't have to let things settle a certain way and just kind of go, oh, that's good. You know, you just, just if, it, if it doesn't resonate with you, that's okay. You receive what God has for us this morning from where you're at, anywhere you're at spiritually. It's okay because he's got a message for all of us. So I'm going to preach from where I'm at, and I want to ask you to just commit to right now just to, with the Lord that you're going to receive it from wherever you're at with him. And I, I, don't, I don't pretend that everybody walks in here this morning at a wonderful place with the Lord. Some of us may have had, I don't know what story you had this week that, that went on in your, in your home or in your life. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about suffering. And uh, like I said, it, it's a little bit of a tough one. So... Um, but one of the things I have learned over my ministry with, with going to visit brothers and sisters who are in a season of suffering is that if we will seek the Savior in our season of suffering, it's going to make it a sacred season. And I mean sacred. Like I chose that word not just because it started with S. That was a bonus. That worked out nicely, you know, a little preacher thing we like to do sometimes, but but if you will seek the Savior in your season of suffering, it will be a sacred season. And I've sat with some brothers and sisters who have suffered, and, and they have taught me this lesson. And so I'm coming to you to share it with you today. Um, you know, suffering is one of those weird things that the world kind of wrestles with. Buddhism tries to tell us to end it. Buddhism is trying to end suffering. Hinduism tells you it's because of things you did in a former life. You built up negative karma, and so that causes you to have suffering in this present life. And if you'll just suffer well or suffer correctly, then your next life will be better and have less suffering. And then you have the secularist, humanist view that tells you it's absolutely ludicrous to think of a God, a divine being, who would use suffering on his divine creatures created in his image to teach them things, to strengthen them, to, to uh, get messages across to them, to use them to spread a message. The secular humanists just can't even fathom that, so they tell you that's ludicrous, don't even consider that. And then you have me who comes and shows up here today who tells you it's, it can be a sacred season. And some of you would sit here all, automatically, you're already maybe the... There's a, there's a reaction to what I'm telling you. When, you. when I say sacred, you think, brother, you don't know. You don't know the hurt. 
You don't know the phone call we had to receive. You don't know my pain. You don't know my suffering. You can't tell me that's sacred. Some of you, not all of you, but some of you would maybe have that thought this morning. And I would say that's fair. You, you, are, you are very fair to say that to me, and that's okay. I would just simply say to you, you as well don't know some of mine. And how the Lord has shown up and the lessons he has taught me. I'm going to try to pass some of those on from his word. But I also am going to pass on some stories, some testimonies from brothers and sisters around the world. Who when they were in a season of suffering and they sought the Savior. It became a sacred season. And it was something they, they cherished. Now, what do we do? to try to view a suffering season as a sacred season. Um, first of all, there, of course, are some things that our enemy is going to try to do when we're in a season of suffering. Our enemy is going to try to bring shame and discouragement and doubt and fear to take away anything God wants to do in this season of suffering. So the enemy is at work. I acknowledge that. The enemy will be at work in a season of suffering. There's some things that the enemy is going to try to tell you, and they're lies. He's going to try to tell you no one cares. You walk into church, you walk into your Bible study, you go to your small group during the week, the enemy is going to whisper to you, nobody cares, nobody understands. That's a lie from the enemy. We want to call that out this morning. The enemy is also going to try to tell you this suffering is going to destroy you. This is too hard. No one could go through what you're going through. No one could endure this. The enemy will tell you that. It's too hard and it will destroy you. It will destroy your faith. Just, just give up now. Just surrender now. Just walk away now. Just lay it all down now and just forget it. That's a lie from the enemy. And then the enemy is going to tell you this one. This is a, this is a powerful one. The enemy will whisper to some of us, God wasn't there to prevent this suffering, and he won't show up in the middle of it. But the good news is that's a lie. The good news is that's a lie. God was there before it. God is in the middle of it. And there's a way that it, this can become a sacred season for you. The way that this becomes a sacred season, what do I mean by sacred? I mean, it becomes a sacred season of suffering when you invite Christ into it with you. Maybe it was, had nothing to do with anything you chose or anything you did. It's just something that happened. And when you invite Christ into it, I'm telling you, he runs in. He runs in and he stands with you. He sits with you. He wraps you up. He binds up wounds. He wants to be in the middle of it with you. So invite him in and it becomes a sacred time. Not an easy time. Not an easy time. Uh, please, 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 this morning, do not misunderstand what I'm telling you when I say that this is a sacred season, that a season of suffering for you or your family or your loved ones can be a sacred season. I am not trying to say it's easy. I'm not trying to convince you that it won't hurt. I'm not trying to convince you to, to not, not feel all that you're going to feel in a season of suffering. Because the brothers and sisters that I've sat with around the world, they've had to feel it. They've had to go through it but they, they invite Christ into it. They seek the Savior in it, and it becomes transformed into this beautiful, sacred season, and it produces some things that are glorious. So I'm not trying to say it's going to be easy. Let's look at the first thing that I think, one of the first things to do in order to make this a sacred season it is surrender. And you, you saw that slide up, uh, a sacred season of surrender. You have to surrender things when you're going through suffering. 
And John 12, 24 is a great example of this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That, that dying, you know, Romans 6 talks about dying to sin and living to God. When you're in a season of suffering, there are things you just have to let go of. You just have to die to. You just have to surrender. But here's the neat thing that the Lord has taught me. There's two parts to surrender. We often think of surrender as this idea of just letting go. I just let go of everything. And that is true. You let go of everything and you, you release that to the Lord. I can't control the things that are happening to my family. I can't control the things that have happened in the past. I can't control these circumstances, Lord, that are swirling around me. And so I'm going to surrender. And you must do that in order for this to be a sacred season. You have to learn how to do that. It's not easy. And you're going to have to do it. It's not a one-time decision. You're going to have to surrender again and again and again. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You surrender and you think, whew. Done. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that little, that little emotion right here. I'm going to leave that hurt right there. I'm going to leave that confusion right there. I'm walking with the Lord, and you're doing something, and you turn around, and it's, it's on you again, and it's right there. Something, uh, uh, a memory comes, uh, something happens, and it's right there with you. And so you've got to surrender daily, hourly, more. It takes a surrender. But, but the second part of surrender is this idea that when you surrender to Christ, he's also asking you to receive some things. Amen? He's got some things when you were surrendering. He's got some things to to give you. And I want to say there's things he wants to give you in a sacred season of suffering that you can't get any other way that you can't get any other way. There's some spiritual strength and depth that he wants to give you. He wants to get you to that place and there's no other way to get to it. There's no other way to receive it except going through some type of suffering. He will produce some spiritual fruit as we surrender to his will during suffering. But it takes an eternal kind of perspective to surrender. I was, I was sitting with a brother once, and, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, we know, and he had gone through some really difficult things physically uh, for his faith, for, for being recognized as a believer, and then walking with Christ, walking, going to church, leading a ministry, and he, he looked at, I, I often will ask them, I have a couple questions that I always ask people when I get a chance to meet with them, and I asked him, I said, it's been so hard, how do you how do you keep walking with the Lord? What you've described to me, I can't even comprehend. And you, but yet you walk with the Lord in joy. And this is his quote. Our trouble lasts for a little while, but we'll be with the Lord for eternity. Amen? That's a surrendering perspective right there. That's a man who, is in a, who has gone through a sacred season of suffering, not a shameful season of suffering. He hasn't walked out of that ashamed. He hasn't walked out of that Uh, discouraged our trouble lasts for a little while and by a little while this brother he didn't mean a couple weeks or months this guy because there was nothing changing in his situation that he could foresee he meant years he's looking at like 80 years he's thinking this life our trouble lasts for a little while but we will be with the Lord for eternity so you have to surrender. I want to tell you about a brother who, who did surrender. He and his wife had surrendered everything. They surrendered everything to the Lord. His name's Alberto. I had a chance to sit with him and his wife in a mall food court area. And they were just so inspiring. They were so encouraging to me. And I sat, but I was, I was kind of focused on their three-year-old daughter while I sat with them. They were, they were sharing things about their ministry. He's a church planter in a very difficult place. And and I was just kind of locked in on the three-year-old daughter because she's about the age of my grandson. And, and she just looked kind of small and kind of, you know, not healthy. And so we finally got around to asking about their health and things. And they said, well, you see, it's a little difficult for us because of our work, our ministry. And um, 
our, our daughter is surviving on boiled rice and a little bit of milk that we can sneak every day. I thought, well, why is that? And he said, well, because I'm a church planter in an area where uh, people don't want me to be church planting, they don't want things of the Lord, they don't want people to know that they have freedom in Christ. He said, they just went to all the people in the market. They stopped beating me. They stopped threatening me uh, in one way. And they just went to all the people in the market. And they said, don't sell them anything. And we'll get them out. That's how they wanted to pressure them to get out. And he, is, he and his wife wouldn't leave. And I, I looked at this little three-year-old girl and I thought, oh my goodness, they were in a season of suffering. But there was something about them, the way they were trusting the Lord, the way they had surrendered everything to the Lord. There was something so sacred in that moment. And you know, I'm, I'm uh, the American mentality kicked in. And I said, man, well, there's a grocery store right here. Let's go get this fixed. We'll, we'll load you up with everything. I mean, we'll buy months of groceries for that little girl. Amen? Amen. I had money in my bag. I could do it. And he shook his head very slowly and he said, no, they'll kill me. I said, what? He said, they'll kill me if I show up and I went outside of their controlled area and got resources and came back with food, come back with food. They're watching my home. When I show up with loads of groceries, they'll kill me. And I just sat there stunned. I, I, there was nothing I could do. So we, we surrendered that to the Lord in prayer that day. We continued to pray for them. And there have been some things that we learned we could do but they're still, they're still in ministry. They did move out of that location to a nearby location just for her help, for the little girl's help, and we were thankful for that. But man, what a sacred time with him. He just continued to do what God called him to do, even in the suffering. He was surrendering. He surrendered everything. Now, this next point, I want to talk about this, uh, the sacred season of silence. Because this is one of those things that comes, I think, is one of those things that comes only in silence, and I want to, or only in suffering, and I, I want to read from Psalm 83. Actually, yeah, you guys have it up there. Um, so Psalm 83, I was, I was in a Bangalore hotel room one time, and I, I had gotten three or four messages back to back to back that were bad news. It was just attacks and people being hurt, and it, and, and it was just really overwhelming to me. And I just sat with the Lord and I was praying and I came to Psalm 83. I often read through the Psalms as I travel. And, and the psalmist captured what I was feeling that morning. Oh God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, oh God. And some of you, some of you have been in a season of suffering and you know what it's like for God to be silent. You know, silence is a funny thing because I can show up at your house and if you're in a, a, a state of grief and I sit with you, I don't have to say a word and I can bring comfort. In silence, there can be comfort sometimes. But then other times when silence goes too long or silence at the, at the inappropriate time, maybe you share something that you're really struggling with with a, a brother or sister or someone and and they don't know what to say, and then they're silent, and it's awkward. And there are times I've, I've experienced some of that with the Lord. Sometimes I've just, I've just pounded the table. God, I need you to change something. I need you to show up. I need you to do something. I don't see you working. And the psalmist, he said, I see the enemies working. The enemies are making an uproar. And some of you who came today, or maybe this past week, or maybe months ago, the enemies in your life were making an uproar. And you took it to the Lord, and there was silence. The psalmist captured my heart that day. That's what I was feeling. Even in my own family, I told you I have to preach from the place I'm at. There are times I've wanted things to change and they won't change. I've asked God to say things and to do things and he isn't doing it. And so then what do I do? And what do you do? If, if we're not seeking the Savior and if we're not surrendering, you know what we do? We 
put that on the nightstand and we don't touch it. Our small group leader calls us, texts us, we don't respond. Time each week rolls around to show up at church, small group leader calls, somebody's calling, you say, you know what? Stomach doesn't feel so good this morning, I'm not going to go. You know what, I had a rough week, a little tired this morning, I'm not going to go. You kind of play this game with God sometimes. If you're going to be silent, fine, I'll be silent too. You're not going to do something for me? Fine, I'm going to step right over here. I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm not telling you anything I haven't done. I told you, I'm going to preach from where I'm at. I want you to receive this from where you're at. And if you're in that state this morning, if you've done that, or if you've taken a couple steps away, oh my goodness, please surrender. Please seek the Savior. Because I want to tell you, in that silence, if you'll push through and trust him in the silence, there is something so sacred and so precious that he wants to give you. He wants to show you so much of his character and so much of his compassion. You have to keep pressing. Don't let that silence, don't let the enemy use that silence. Because because the psalmist continues... And look what he says. They lay crafty plans. The enemy is laying crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. My brother, my sister, this morning, you are treasured. You are treasured more than you even know. Your heavenly father treasured you so much, he sent his only son to go hang on a cross, to go through a season of suffering for you, to redeem you. Don't let that silence, don't let the enemy use that silence to tell you God's not working. I sat with a sister one time. She was able, you can show the picture now, she was, she had had her husband killed. Her husband had been killed. He was shot in their home. They ministered in a village in India. He was shot in their home. He was a guy who would take people to the hospitals. He would put them in his car. He would drive them to the hospitals. He was doing good ministry. He was planting a church, planting churches. People knocked on his door late one night. They didn't answer. They thought maybe it's somebody up to no good. They start pounding. They finally hear the door of this little village, little village house being rattled. So he finally gets up. He leaves his wife in bed. He goes to the door before he can open the door a shot is fired comes through the door and he dies she had some seasons of silence she had she was able to share with me as I sat in that in that home I sat just feet away from where he was shot she shared with me how much it hurt how much she missed her husband But then she also shared with me how faithful the Lord had been. That the Lord, the Holy Spirit, had come to her in so many powerful moments to comfort. That comforter, Jesus called him the comforter. He came and he comforted. But she had to push through the silence. Another another widow in another part of the world, she told my wife and I on a trip, she said, when my husband was killed, he was a denominational leader in the country. The government took him out. And she said, I told the Lord, this road is too hard. She said, this road is too hard for me. And then, and then this was 15 years after the fact she's telling us, and she still got tears in her eyes when she shared it. It was still hard. But then she leaned up in her chair a little bit. And she said, but you know what? The road was too hard for me, but the Lord didn't intend for me to go in that road alone. Whatever you're going through, Whatever your season of suffering is for you or your family or your children or your grandchildren or your parents, the Lord does not intend for you to go through it alone. He is with you. Seek the Savior in a season of suffering, and it transforms. God transforms it into a sacred season, a spiritually sacred season. The last point... I'll just be honest, I'm not happy with the, with the name of the point, so just let me get over that, okay? Um, 
but there's a really powerful scripture, so we'll go to the scripture now, because I don't love the, the three S's thing kind of bugs me. I feel like I worked a little too hard to make it cute, and I'm sorry. Sorry. Forgive me, Lord. But this scripture is so powerful. I was on a plane. Oh, Lord, you're not going to do that here, are you? You are. I was on a plane. I was trying to read through the Bible in a year. How many of you committed to do that before? Yep, I have. Yeah, I just didn't get there. So anyway, <laughs> um, I got to Leviticus 24.2. Talking about the tabernacle and instructions for worship. God told Moses, command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp that a light may be kept burning regularly. And I said, Lord, you know what I'm going through. And I feel like I'm being beaten. I feel like I'm being pressed. And he said, that's right, you are. You are. And, and you know what? I've led you into this pressing. I don't always like to hear that from the Lord. Sometimes he speaks that way to me. I don't know if he speaks gently, more gently to you or not, but sometimes to me he's a little direct. I, I need it. And he said, I led you into it. Because as I press you, a light is going to burn. There is going to be fuel that will come from the pressing, this version, the ESV says, beaten olives. I mean, I was on that plane and I felt like a beaten olive. You ever felt that way? You wake up in the morning, you just think, Lord, I, this, do I have to go through this today again? Didn't we do this last week? Didn't we do this yesterday? Now we are again, here we are. Yep. If you will seek the Savior, in your suffering and if you will ask him to make it a sacred season there is a worship and a light that is going to shine that I will tell you the enemy hates the enemy cannot stand when a suffering circumstances come and it does not discourage God's people from worshiping the worship we had this morning some of you walked in here and you were able to worship and it was a light burning brightly in this tabernacle. You were worshiping because God has pressed you. God has taken you through surrender and silence. And now he's got you in this place where you, you can worship fully in a way that others can't. There were some parents that I... I didn't have a chance to meet them. I met a brother who was delivering Bibles in a country. These parents had to go through a season of suffering. They had to go through a surrendering season. But they were worshipers. Oh, and it was sacred. Their daughter had received a Bible. And the Bible that she read encouraged her so much and, and gave her such a strength that when some anti-government guerrillas came to forcefully recruit her as they had recruited her older sister, come join our, our purposes, come join our drug trafficking. And, and it wasn't a volunteer thing. This is force recruiting. They come, they come with guns. And she held her Bible that she had received and she said, no, I won't go. My Lord Jesus tells me I, I don't have to go with you. And those groups, the group leaders said, fine. So they take her. They raped her and they killed her. And then they dropped her in the center of the church. Because they wanted to send a message to the church. Anybody who stands up to us, this is what happens. And I was just so stunned by this story. She received a Bible. And it cost her her life. I was just so heartbroken at this story, this young girl, what she had to go through. And, and the man who delivered the Bible, he was the Bible distributor, he said, hey, 
I just can't even explain how, how in the world he can do it. He, with a smile on his face, he said, and her parents are still faithful. Her parents faithfully attend that church where their daughter's body was placed. They worship the Lord. Had they been pressed? Yes, absolutely. They sought the Lord. They turned it over to him, and it was a sacred season. Their faith became stronger. The Lord took them to places they never thought they would have to go. But he was faithful to be there with them. Now, lastly, I want to... I want to say some of you, let's go, let's go back to that idea of surrender. I just, I just felt so clearly last night that I was supposed to say this. Somebody may be here and they can hear my voice and, and you may say, all of those stories are great, brother. That's fine. But my suffering is something that I did. You see, my suffering is self-inflicted. And so I just don't know if God can use that. I don't know if God wants to show up in that. Let me tell you, our God is gracious and merciful. Our God's love is steadfast, never ending. And I'm telling you, he wants to use that suffering as well. He wants to use that suffering to draw you to surrender to him today. So if you're in a season of self-inflicted suffering, this still applies to you. It can still be made sacred. He can still transform it into something sacred if you'll seek him in it, if you'll surrender it to him right now. I want to ask the prayer teams to come up if they would. Psalm 145, 8 and 9 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is slow to anger. So if, you, if you're in a self-inflicted season of suffering, listen to that. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is slow to anger. And he is steadfast in his love for you. He, his love is abounding and steadfast. The Lord is good to all. I'm not making this up. I'm reading this from right here, from God's word. It's true. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. So if you are in a season of suffering, I want to encourage you to come up. I want to encourage you to come up and ask somebody to pray with you. Pray that you could surrender to it. Pray that the Lord would make it a sacred season for you. You need him to make it a sacred season. Seek the Savior right now. If, if there's a past season of suffering that continues to bring shame, continues to bring confusion, continues to bring discouragement, come up and let someone pray with you that it could be transformed into a sacred season of suffering. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for all the things you're doing. Thank you for your message of love. Thank you that you are merciful and gracious to all as we go through a season of suffering, Father. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this together. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seen. In the heavenly place undefeated With the one who has conquered it all You are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say Crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Today, if you're seeking a Savior through suffering, and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus for all the days of your life. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to open that decision to you. If you're on the radio or you're online watching, just go ahead. You can say yes to Jesus on there. If you're in person, I just want you to slip up a hand with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you want to say yes to Jesus and follow him all the days of your life, thank you. Once you raise your hand, you can put it down. Thank you. If you all just say this prayer with me today, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. Help me follow you for all the days of my life, never turning back. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Everybody says amen. Amen, amen. Now all the angels are celebrating in heaven, so we should do the same as well. For those of you that said yes here in person today, we have a packet we want to give to you guys in the Welcome Center with information. But if you'll go ahead and you'll just text yes to 918-766-9117, we have information that we can send to you as well. So if you're online listening on the radio and you'll just text the word yes, to 918-766-9117. We will get information to you today. But now as we leave, I just want to leave energized, ready to go, living as a sacrifice, surrendering our lives to our Lord and Savior Jesus. So if we could stand up all across this room today and just raise our hands towards heaven, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go with God today.